Hello everyone, we are going to start. Um, I am Ami Moradam, Associate Research Scholar at the Center, uh, the Sharmin and Bijan Mustafar Rahmani uh, for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. And we are delighted and honored today to welcome Laurence uh, Louer, uh, Professor at Sciences Po, the Center uh, for International Research in Paris. Uh, she served as permanent consultant for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs between 2004 and 2009. Uh, she was the editor of Critique Internationale between 2006 and 2016. Her research mostly focuses on identity politics uh, in the Middle East. She has in particular work on Arab politics in Israel and on Shia politics in the Gulf uh, monarchies. She's now uh, finishing a project on the political economy of uh, labor market reforms in the Gulf monarchies, and she's the author of uh, To Be an Arab in Israel in 2007. Uh, her Another book, Transnational National Shia Politics, Religious and Political Network in the Gulf, was published in 2008. And uh, another book again, Shism and Politics in the Middle East, 2012. And her last book in French, Sunnit uh, Shiit Histoire Politique d'une Discorde, will be translated soon into uh, English and published in 2009 uh, by Princeton uh, University uh, Press. Uh, before uh, starting uh, the talk, I would like to let you know that uh, we have another talk uh, uh, next week on Monday um, by Aryan Tabatabai, Iran uh, in its regional environment, uh, on March 5th at 4.30 at uh, Robertson Hall, room 002. So uh, you can find this information as well on our website. Uh, uh, so the title of uh, Laurent's presentation uh, will be I don't have the title. <laughs> Shia, I mean, uh, I, would, I would repeat as uh, Shia in the Gulf monarchies. Uh, and their relations with and Iran. And their relations with Iran. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> Please help me welcome <laughs> Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. And enjoy the food. Um, OK, so you hear me? Yeah. So there is a, a common wisdom about Iran and the Shia communities in the Middle East. And this common wisdom poses that their relation is like uh, a relation between kin's group and a kin state. That is that Iran and the Shia communities share quasi primordial uh, identity that makes Shia communities naturally the brokers of Im Iranian manipulative policies and these policies would aim at establishing a kind of Iranian hegemony over the region. I think this perception is not new and it exists actually since Shiism was made the state religion in Iran by the Safavid in uh, 1501. And it is true that since uh, that period, all Iranian regimes, including the Pahlavi regime that wanted to impose secularism on Iranian society, uh, have used Shiism as a tool to project their influence uh, in the region. This perception uh, of uh, Iran using Shiism was reinforced after the 1979 revolution, uh, when the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran declared its aim to export uh, its revolution worldwide. And since 2011, we hear again, uh, uh, and we we, we hear and we, we read uh, 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 in a lot of media outlets, be it in the West or in the Middle East, uh, uh, that uh, 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 Iran uh, uh, is uh, again trying to impose a kind of hegemony uh, and that uh, Iranian hegemonic policies and strategies uh, uh, are at the heart of uh, Middle Eastern geopolitics. And I think this perception, as in particular since uh, 2011, uh, be uh, it has been used by incumbents as a way to justify the repression of protests, in particular in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. And it's also uh, a tool 
uh, uh, to justify the war in Yemen in some, in some ways. It did in Bahrain. Um, there is um, a majority of Shias, huh? the majority of the, the population, the Bahraini national population, uh, is professing the Shia creed. And the protests there in 2011 mainly involved Shias, huh? although in the beginning the protests were not sectarian, but since the majority of the population is Shias and since the opposition in Bahrain is structured around Shia Islamic movements, it was logical that the majority of the protesters would be, uh, would be Shias. In Saudi Arabia also, the demonstrations that occurred in 2011 and also in 2012 uh, exclusively concern some parts of uh, the Shia populated areas of the eastern province, in particular around the city of uh, Qatif. So describing uh, the protest, this protest in these two countries as resulting from incitement by Iran has been the incumbent's preferred uh, tool, uh, way, technique to discredit them and justify turning a deaf ear on demands of democratization. So what I propose in this presentation is to try to refine our understanding of uh, the relations between Iran and Shia communities by exploring in comparative in comparative perspective, how these communities in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Kuwait have reacted to some political dynamics coming from Iran since uh, the 1979 revolution. In these three countries, which are directly neighboring Iran, there are significant Shia communities and there also exists something that I would call a Shia political factor that is contributing to structure in many ways uh, the political landscape. My argument uh, will be that Shia communities are very often victims of preconceptions that in large part form independently of what they actually do, meaning no matter what they do, they are suspected of being agents of Iranian influence. However, I also argue that these preconceptions have different implications, uh, uh, different impacts according to the local context, and this is it is this local context that I will try to analyze in my presentation. So I always say that in the Gulf there are two models of uh, uh, relations between the state and the Shias. And these two models, they result from different patterns of incorporation of the Shias in the long-term state formation process. On the one hand, we have Saudi Arabia and we have Bahrain, which are part of the same pattern, the same model. Uh, in these two countries, the relationship between the Shias and the rulers and the incumbents are particularly strained. Um, and also, though it varies in intensity and in rational according to the domestic and regional political circumstances, we can say that there is a state-sponsored state discrimination against the state, against the Shias, sorry, in these uh, two countries. However, these states do not have in common a religious ideology that could explain this situation. Indeed, if we look at Bahrain, we see that the rulers are very liberal when it comes to religion. And for example, Shias in Bahrain, they benefit from full religious freedom. Uh, the ninth and the tenth uh, day of the month of Muharram, for example, are official uh, days off uh, since uh, the independence of, uh, of Bahrain in 1971. And it is only by contrast in Saudi Arabia that we can see at work uh, uh, religious ideology as a, as a factor which explains why uh, the relations between the state and, uh, and the Shia community there are, are, are strained. Indeed, as you know, uh, Wahhabism uh, 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 is a kind of official ideology in Saudi Arabia and Wahhabism consider, considers that Shia uh, practices are deviant and even un-Islamic. So what could be the common point between Bahrain and Saudi Arabia? It is that both of these states were created as uh, the result of military conquests. And during this military conquest, the Shias fell on the side of the vanquished. So we have a, a, a forced uh, incorporation in, in the state, in these two, uh, in these two countries, uh, which has resulted in a highly 
polarized social stratification in which the Sunni Shia divide is overlapping uh, with uh, over divides like the conqueror conquered uh, divide and the alien na na native divide. Indeed, in these two countries, the Shias have developed what I call a nativist narrative. They portray themselves as the original inhabitants uh, uh, by contrast, uh, in particular, to the ruling dynasties and the Al Khalifa in Bahrain and the Al Saud in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, who are presented uh, 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 by ordinary Shias and also uh, Shia Islamic uh, activists as alien invaders. In Bahrain, of course, this uh, situation is reinforced by the fact that the Shias are the majority of the national population. Well, um, maybe 10 years ago, uh, they, they were still 70% seven, uh, of the national population, although this uh, share has probably decreased uh, 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 today because of uh, policies by, by the rulers to uh, give the citizenship to Sunni foreigners uh, in order to try to modify the, the balance between Sunnis and Shia in the population. Nevertheless, the Shia still have this feeling that they are the majority uh, of the national population and that because of that, uh, they should have, they should get a larger share of uh, the political power, the institutional political power and, uh, and uh, a larger share of the wealth also. By contrast, in Saudi Arabia, we are being faced with a population that is largely a minority. Of course, we only have estimates huh? and no official data, but in Saudi Arabia, the Shias probably represent between 8% and 20% of the national population. And I think something important to say right now is that in Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia, the Shias claim Arab descent and even pure Arab descent, huh? with the exception of a small uh, community of, uh, of Hajam, uh, of uh, Shias of Iranian descent in, uh, in Bahrain. So by contrast with the case of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, we have the Kuwaiti case, which has been described uh, by some people as a success story. And uh, their local estimations evaluate uh, the share of the Shias in the national population at around 25%. Again, this, again, these are uh, only estimates, of course. Uh, they have historically enjoyed a particularly good relationship with the ruling family, the Al-Sabah family, uh, who is, of course, Sunni. Um, in Kuwait, uh, the Shias are organized in three uh, diasporic <coughs> communities that maintain extensive cross-border family ties with their families, place of origin. The largest group is the people who are called the Ajab, that is, uh, um, people of Iranian descent that came from Iran at different historical periods uh, uh, for uh, different reasons, uh, uh, mostly uh, to do business uh, or sometimes also to escape uh, e economic hardship in the late 19th century and early 20th century. The other Shia group are the Hassawiyin. Uh, these people are Arab and they come from uh, the region of Hassa in uh, today's Saudi Arabia, in the eastern part of, of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And they mostly came to escape uh, uh, Wahhabi uh, conquests. Um, and the third group, the smallest group, are called the Bahalna. And these are people who come from, uh, from Bahrain and, and came to Kuwait also at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, mostly to escape political instability and economic hardship in Bahrain. All these uh, Shia groups have exposed the dominant narrative about the Kuwaiti state formation. And this dominant narrative describes uh, the formation of Kuwait as the result of the progressive gathering of people and groups from uh, different parts of the Middle East for the sake of a shared economic project. Kuwait is indeed is seen by many Shias, and not only Shias, of course, as a haven to develop uh, economic uh, activities, commercial activities, or to escape hardship at home. 
So Kuwaiti Shias tend to see the state as a shelter from problems, and the ruling family huh, as uh, the head of this, uh, of this shelter. This is because of not only the circumstances of their establishment in Kuwait, but also because of uh, the patterns of coalition politics in Kuwait. Indeed, uh, uh, throughout history, the ruling Al Sabah family in Kuwait has faced opposition, which came mostly uh, from uh, uh, the Sunni mer merchant oligarchy, uh, 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 historically, uh, uh, a segment of the society who embraced uh, Arab nationalism um, in the 40s and 50s. And today, uh, opposition to the ruling family comes mostly from uh, the Sunni Islamist movements and the tribal, Sunni tribal segments of uh, the society. And it happens that historically, the opposition to uh, the ruling Al Sabah family has been anti Shia for different reasons. The Arab nationalists, because they perceive the Shias as being Iranians, so not really Kuwaitis, uh, uh, the Sunni Islamists and the Salafis for religious and ideological reasons uh, also. So, in this specific uh, uh, political landscape, it was, I would say, logical that the Shias would size uh, with the ruling family against uh, the opposition. And we can say that until today, the Shias are uh, uh, one of the government's most reliable constituencies. <coughs> so the way uh, uh, the Shias were incorporated in these different uh, state formation processes uh, mediates dynamics uh, uh, that come from Iran in different ways. So in all the three countries, uh, the Iranian revolution saw the radicalization of uh, Shia Islamic movements that were pre-existing the, uh, the revolution. These movements had taken roots in the Gulf monarchies, and in particular in these three uh, countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait, in the, in the 60s and in the 70s, uh, resulting from the influence of Iraqi uh, Shia Islamic movements that were tied to uh, religious institutions, Shia religious institutions in the city of Najaf uh, and in the city of Kerbala. So these uh, two networks uh, uh, resulted in the, the emergence of two rival uh, Shia Islamic movements. They were rivals, however, they shared a similar ideology, which basically was that they wanted to uh, establish an Islamic state in its Shia version. Uh, uh, and when it was not possible, or when this strategy seemed irrelevant, they uh, promoted societal re-Islamization and also the empowerment <coughs> of, of the Shia communities. Significantly, however, while following the Iranian revolution, the pattern of alliance between the Shia MPs and the rulers was temporarily broken uh, in Kuwait, only in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia did this radicalization turned into a revolutionary project to overthrow uh, the regimes through mass demonstration, terrorist violence, and coup d'etat. In Kuwait, even the pro-Iranian activists always remained committed to the maintenance of Kuwait as an emirate ruled by the El Sabah dynasty. And they mostly used uh, uh, the mobilization, I mean, the support for the Islamic Republic of Iran as a model in order to promote uh, uh, the political and social upward mobility of uh, the Shias as a community in Kuwait. So it was uh, mostly a tool of local empowerment and not a tool to disrupt uh, uh, existing uh, the, I mean, the position of the incumbents. This show how the impact of the Iranian revolution was mediated by domestic circumstances. It resonated very differently uh, according to these established patterns of interaction between the Shias and the state. Another more recent example of how uh, local contexts mediate uh, dynamics coming from Iran is the 2003-2011 uh, period. As you may know, the fall of uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq and the arrival to power of Shia Islamic movements in Baghdad fostered the expansion of Iranian networks of influence in Iraq, 
and created also uh, among Arab rulers the perception that the new regional order was empowering Iran at their expense. Interestingly, at this period, the reaction of Gulf, Gulf rulers in order to try to deflect uh, uh, this so-called Shia revival uh, and Iranian uh, expansion was uh, to engage in uh, policies of, uh, um, of what I call politics of recognition. Uh, that is granting the Shias a measure of recognition as a legitimate religious collective different from um, the Sunnis. This was an attempt to secure the loyalty of Shia citizens and dissuade them from engaging in subversive activities with the support of Iran. So somehow increased national integration was seen as a buffer against a subversive, subversive Iranian influence. And I think it is really what this is all about. Uh, national integration prevents subversive influences from outside. So in this respect, the most spectacular shift occurred again in Saudi Arabia, where the regime relaxed the systematic obstacles that uh, were put for decades uh, to the construction of new Shia mosques, for example. And the government in Saudi Arabia also accepted uh, a general upgrading of the Shia personal status court system. So why such strategies of what I call co-optation were chosen at this particular period rather than a mere policy of repression, for example. I think there are three factors that can explain that, and I will insist on the third one. So the first factor is the legacy of uh, a rapprochement period that uh, occurred between Iran and the Gulf monarchies in the aftermath of the Gulf uh, War of 1991, and the, Gulf, the war to liberate Kuwait, which saw a general rapprochement between the West and Iran, as Iran supported uh, the war to liberate Kuwait. A second factor was also uh, American pressures on Saudi Arabia following 9-11, uh, 2001, uh, the attacks um, uh, in New York, and also a general shift that occurred at this period that was, in my view, largely orchestrated by the American government a shift in the perception of the Shias in Western public opinion. Shias became to be seen as victims of the Sunni majority, as victims of uh, religious intolerance. And so they were seen as legitimately seeking to improve their lot. And they were not any more or less seen as uh, uh, in the 80s, you know, as a fanatic uh, uh, people. Uh, uh, these were the images that uh, were the legacy of, of the Iranian revolution. A third factor uh, helps to refine our understanding of how, again, a local context mediates uh, political dynamics from Iran. Um, and this factor is the uh, enhanced intra-dynastic factionalism uh, uh, in the three countries under, under study. This, um, enhanced intra-dynastic factionalism modified the position of the Shias in the political landscape. So in Saudi Arabia, the king, uh, Abdallah, uh, was facing the competition by the Sudairi faction of the ruling dynasty. At the time, this powerful uh, dynastic uh, faction, this faction from the Al-Saud dynasty was embodied by the powerful minister of the interior, Nayef. The main issue of the competition was the control for the succession, uh, for the position of, of crown prince. And this uh, competition fostered uh, Abdallah, the king, to seek supporters outside of the family. Uh, and he, in the process, became uh, one of the main backers of a policy of Shia recognition and a policy of further integrating uh, the Shias, while uh, the Minister of the Interior uh, in particular was positioning himself as the upholder of conservatism and of the Wahhabi um, dogma, if you want. A similar situation occurred in Bahrain, where the 2000s saw a mounting rivalry between, on the one hand, uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Khalifa uh, bin Salman al Khalifa and uh, a young reformist faction within the Al Khalifa dynasty, which was gathered around the King Hamad, but more particularly 
Oh, so Iran is uh, son, uh, uh, Prince Salman, the Crown Prince uh, Salman bin Hamad al Khalifa. And in this context, uh, the young Crown Prince sought the support of the Shia Islamic opposition, which was at the time uh, embodied by a very large uh, Shia political organization called Al Wifaq, which has been banned uh, like a year ago or, or more. And uh, this uh, Al Wifaq movement decided uh, to support the reformist faction, hoping that uh, together, through this alliance, uh, they could sideline the old guard, which was seen as a major obstacle to more political liberalization. So, in the process, Al Wifaq became uh, a typical co opted opposition. In Kuwait, also, we see uh, this uh, enhanced uh, intra dynastic factionalism. Um, so, two things in Kuwait happened in the 2000s. Uh, so, on, on the one hand, uh, there, there was, as I explained already, a persistent uh, a strain between the government and the parliament, which was dominated and is still uh, until today dominated by a Sunni Islamist tribal opposition. And on the other hand, uh, also, uh, we saw an intensification of this intra-dynastic uh, competition, in particular between two nephews of uh, the Emir, Nasser al-Sabah, uh, who was prime minister in Kuwait between 2006 and 2011, and Ahmed al-Fahed al-Sabah, the other. Uh, these two people competing for the position of, of crown prince and for the control of the succession process. So each of these uh, uh, two uh, rivals uh, competed in order to garner the support of the MPs uh, at the parliament, but also uh, 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 the support of uh, all sorts of, of uh, political actors in the, in the society. And in this context, uh, the Shias became uh, one of the main supporters of uh, Nasir al-Muhammad, uh, uh, who is a career diplomat and he, he was uh, the ambassador to Iran before uh, the revolution. And he has retained strong business connections, in particular in Iran, and is really portrayed by the opposition as being like a pro-Iranian, uh, 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 etc. So it is this enhanced uh, factionalism within the dynasty that uh, 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 permitted the Shias to become again really at the center of, of the, 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 political, uh, the political landscape. Uh, I, I, I told you uh, in my first part that, that they had been somehow sidelined right after the revolution, but they are uh, again today uh, and since uh, the 2000s again uh, a pillar uh, of, uh, of the government actually and, and of the regime. So, more recently, and it will be my, my last part, um, the 2011 Arab uprising have had a significant impact on the relations between the Shias and the incumbents in uh, the Gulf monarchies, in particular, uh, again, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And this, uh, uh, the analysis of the, the impact of the 2000 uh, events on uh, uh, these two countries, uh, is another example uh, of the way the local context uh, persistently mediates uh, differently regional dynamics. So, as I told you, in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, uh, the protests mostly concern Shia you know, uh, um, in the two countries. And these events fostered a, very, uh, a, a genuine uh, paradigm shift in the approach of the Shia issue by the Bahraini and Saudi regimes. But again, what is interesting is that the Kuwaitis reacted totally differently. In Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, this paradigm shift has been described by my colleague Justin Gengler as a securitization of the Shia problem. It occurred as the Bahraini internal dynastic balance of power of the 2000s was disrupted. The reformist faction uh, and its alliance with the Shia opposition did not survive the mass demonstrations. Uh, in particular, because, uh, 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 because the trust that had been built uh, uh, in the 2000s was, was destroyed by the participation of El Wifaq in the, in the protests. So the old guard uh, of the dynasty argued that the reformist strategy of co-opting the Shia Islamic opposition has, had been misleading, since uh, the, the Shia Islamic uh, activists had taken the, the first uh, 
occasion to uh, to go to the streets to demand what they had been uh, unable to achieve uh, by uh, peacefully negotiating uh, with the government. A similar pattern occurred in, occurred in Saudi Arabia, where the trust was also weakened, leaving only uh, repression as the only credible option in the eyes of the incumbent to deal with the Shia issue. Clearly, I think that the 2011 uh, um, year and the events that happened uh, uh, at this period were analyzed by the incumbents in both countries as a failure of the co-option strategy that had been uh, um, chosen uh, in the 2000s. So I was saying significantly in Kuwait it was totally different since the pattern of cooperation and alliance with, uh, between the Shias and uh, the ruling dynasty was left untouched. Um, again, now, uh, this is uh, because uh, opposition kept coming mostly uh, from the Sunni Islamist and tribal segments of, uh, of the society. And this opposition uh, in 2011 succeeded uh, to obtain the, um, the dismissal of the Prime Minister, Nasser al-Mohammed, so this pro-Shia uh, minister. Uh, um, and uh, so this pushed, uh, of course, the, the government to, uh, to close ranks uh, once more with, uh, with, their, uh, with their Shia alliance. So this, uh, uh, the way, I mean, uh, uh, this uh, Shia ruling family was, uh, was consolidated, did not go without posing some uh, problems to Kuwait, uh, in particular in its uh, relation with Saudi Arabia, uh, 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 since uh, the Kuwaitis refused to participate uh, in the repression of the, uh, of the protest in Bahrain. And the Kuwaitis were also extremely uh, unenthusiastic at uh, the project of Saudi Arabia and to, to unify further the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, uh, um, which was for the Kuwaitis, as for other uh, Gulf monarchies, the Omanis, for example, uh, it was uh, an, seen as an undesirable consolidation of Saudi leadership. So I now jump to my conclusion. <laughs> so. What I would like to emphasize as a conclusion um, is that um, this uh, compar comparison between the three uh, situations can help us to refine our understanding of, of how some factors like ethnicity and the intensity of cross-border relations play out you know, uh, in the uh, relationship between the Shias and, and the states. Indeed, um, the Kuwaiti model of coexistence works well in spite of the fact that Kuwaiti Shias, by contrast to Saudi and Bahraini Shias, are in the majority of Iranian descent. Also, um, and I know that this would need further empirical data, I think what can say that the cross-border relations between the Kuwaiti Shias and Iran might be more intense than those of the Saudi and the Bahraini Shias. Indeed, I met quite a lot of Kuwaiti Shias who, for example, they continue to speak Persian in their family circles. They also marry within their extended families in Iran. Others have uh, important business relations in Iran. And uh, uh, also, it is not uncommon until today to uh, meet Iranian migrants in Kuwait uh, who come and go between Iran and Kuwait and uh, uh, their circulations is embedded in larger networks built around uh, Kuwaiti Shia notables, mostly businessmen and or uh, uh, political, uh, political figures, members of the parliament. I think this is something that is not found in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, or at least not on such a scale. <clears throat> so a conclusion of that could be that the intensity of cross-border relations between Shia communities and Iran is not per se a destabilizing factor. Support for this argument could also come from observing the situations, for example, in the United Arab Emirates and in Oman, where there are also intense trade relations uh, with Iran that pass through the circulation 
of people across borders, in particular the Shias, Omani Shias or Emirati Shias or Iranian traders huh, uh, also. But we don't have in these two countries uh, the deleterious relations that uh, we have between the states and the local uh, communities, the Shia communities in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, for example. So at the end of the day, what I try to argue is that uh, uh, it is mainly because of pre-existing patterns of incorporation of the Shias in the state formation process. Uh, uh, and because these, uh, uh, this incorporation is deficient, that political dynamics um, coming from Iran can be destabilizing. And in brief, factors of destabilization are mostly locally crafted. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laurence, uh, for your very interesting talk, Shia in the Gulf and the relation with Iran. This time I won't forget the Iranian part. The floor is open for questions and answers. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for the uh, informative talk. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, term, uh, export of revolution, that you touched upon at the very beginning of your talk, uh, that was part of me. Um, <coughs> as to whether it was real or it's just something people just kept uh, reiterating uh, just, uh, you know, uh, like that. Uh, because the history has clearly shown that it has had you know, minimal, if any, effect, impact that we're talking about. And second of all, I mean, just a, a matter of practicality. Uh, you know, I understand how you export commodities like oil, you know, you load up a ship and you, you know, send it over to, to South Korea, whatever. Uh, but uh, how do you export revolution? I mean, uh, words, you know what I'm saying? <coughs> how does the mechanic of ex exporting a revolution exactly work? Okay, shall I answer to, or shall, shall we take it? Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, so to, to limit ourselves to the Gulf monarchies, um, I think signs of the exportation of the revolution were very clear. No? Uh, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain were targets of Iranian media outlets. Uh, 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 the Saudis were, uh, uh, you know, uh, criticized for being the allies of the West and of the U.S. in particular for mismanaging Mecca and Medina, etc., etc. Um, <coughs> and. Um, I did not mention it in my talk, but in Saudi Arabia, in November 1979, there was a, an uprising. It's called an intifada uh, um, until today. Um, uh, it has in the Shia memory, in the local Shia memory. And this uh, uprising was fostered uh, not only by mere enthusiasm for the Islamic revolution in Iran, but also it was organized uh, by local <laughs> networks of Shia Islamic militants that were tied not that much to Iran directly than to, uh, um, to uh, uh, an Iraqi Shia movement, uh, which was called the, the Message Movement. And this Iraqi movement was pro-Iranian revolution. Okay? In Bahrain, uh, there was a, an attempt of a coup d'etat in 1981, which was uh, uh, organized by a Bahraini branch of this same uh, Kerbela-based movement with the logistic support of Iran. Now the question is always, and, and it's not my field of expertise, huh? who in Iran did that, which part of the system, of the regime, etc. One of the theses that I find most uh, credible is that these Shia Iraqi Islamic movements pushed, uh, in particular, the radical factions of the Iranian government to export the revolution, in particular to Iraq, of course, and, and, and to the Gulf monarchies. So it was like pre existing Shia Islamic movements with an Iraqi basis, mostly, that uh, 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 were expecting uh, 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 from Iran uh, to do something about the fate and the poor fate of, of Shia communities in, in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Uh, uh, and, and somehow there has been a kind of combination, uh, kind of, uh, yes, uh, 
between the dynamics coming from the Iranian regime itself or from part of the Iranian regime and dynamics coming from Iraqi Shia Islamism and from the local communities. Again, uh, in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, the Islamic revolution in Iran was seen you know, as the perfect opportunity to do something about the, the, the situation of, of the Shias in, in these two countries. Okay, so I think it's, it's a combination of, of several types of dynamics. Okay, so to answer to the last part of your question, how do you export a revolution? <coughs> export of the revolution can mean many things. For example, in Kuwait, and the Shia Islamic uh, activists there always told where well, we are loyal to the ruling dynasty, but we think that the Iranian model is really excellent, but we can only apply it in Iran because in Kuwait it would be impossible because Shias are only a minority, etc., etc. So exporting the revolution meant for them basically exporting Iranian influence, uh, support for the Wilayat al faqih doctrine and model of government, etc., etc., mobilizing the Shias uh, in Kuwait in order for them to claim more rights, a larger share of the power, etc., etc. So exporting a revolution can mean exporting a propaganda. It can be uh, only a, a traditional policy of influence, which, is, which it is today, I think. Uh, today we are not anymore in the 80s and, and, and we are not anymore. Uh, exporting a revolution does not mean the same thing that it meant uh, previously. So, Thank you very much for your nice talk. You know, Iranian government undeniably you know, influencing Shiite wherever they are, right? There is a pocket of Shiite in Hezbollah, Syria, Iraq, and other countries that you mentioned, and it's very well perceived by those Shiite, right? Why do you think the opposite of that doesn't exist, that dynamic influence of Sunni government and Sunni Shiite the, the, the population in Iran? The minority Sunnis, 25, 30% of the Iranian population, why you know, the opposite of that doesn't exist, that export of revolution that Iranian efficiently do, no matter what the outcome is, good or bad, why the opposite of that you think is not as efficient? Well, it does exist, I think. Uh, it does exist, but it's not as efficient. It's not as efficient that we see as a movement, but you see the opposite of that very efficiently anyway for Shia. Why do you think this? It's a, it's an tentative explanation. Yeah. Maybe with the case of Iran, we have a, a long uh, habit uh, of sponsoring Shia religious institutions outside of Iran. I, I said uh, since the Safavid, we've seen this pattern, uh, especially in Iraq, uh, I mean, in what is today Iraq. So we have long established networks, which are in part state networks, no, networks of the Iranian state, but also networks of uh, Iranian religious institutions, which can be actually independent from the state or have a certain room of maneuver and a certain autonomy from the state, networks of students and professors of the religious seminaries. And, and maybe we can say that, that this historical depth is, is, uh, is, uh, is making uh, uh, um, you know, Iranian attempts at influencing Shia communities more efficient. Mm -hmm. We can also say that in many respects, uh, uh, Shias tend to see Iran as, as, the, as a shelter and as the patron of, of, of the Shias worldwide. And there is still this perception that if there is a problem, we can always expect something on Iran. We can go, at least we can go to Iran and find a shelter, mm -hmm. as it happened in the 80s where many uh, Shia Islamic activists uh, uh, of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, for example, they just left uh, uh, and escaped repression by, by, by sheltering in Iran. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, that, 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 would be, uh, that would be an explanation. However, we must be also careful because especially since the 90s, uh, a lot of uh, Shia Islamic activists have realized that seeking the help of Iran can have uh, negative effects, you know, because it reinforces this uh, preconception that, that there is this intimate tie between the Shia communities and Iran and that Shias are acting as Iranian agents, etc. So we have seen in the 80s and in the 2000s, in particular in the context of these policies of co-optation and further integration of the Shias, uh, people who were revolutionaries in the 80s 
saying, look, now uh, uh, we must uh, uh, understand Shia politics as local Shia politics. Our aim is not to export the revolution, is not to establish an Islamic Republic. It must be clear to everybody that our aim is to reinforce, to empower the Shia communities locally by pushing, pressuring the regimes to democratize. So it was both, a, I would say, a reformist, a democratic agenda and a community agenda, a communal agenda. Mm -hmm. now, the, the two being seen as, as going together, mm -hmm. if you want. So I think that the older generation of Shia Islamic activists are aware that relying or hoping for the support of Iran can be dangerous and, thus that, and also that, that it, it could lead nowhere. Yeah, uh, because I, I mentioned it very quickly, but in the early 90s, I mean, from the late 80s to the early 90s, there has been a shift in Iranian foreign policies because of uh, internal uh, shifts within the Iranian regime uh, and the sidelining of the radical factions which were sponsoring uh, the, uh, the Islamic Republic. And in this framework, for example, the Bahraini and uh, uh, the Saudi Shia activists were living in Iran, they were just asked to leave. We, we don't need you anymore. And more than that, you are a problem for us because we want to reconcile with Saudi Arabia and with the Gulf monarchies and with the US. We are hoping that Iran will become again a normal country uh, within the national community. So thank you very much, but uh, now it's over. Uh, and, and so these people had to leave and they established to Syria and they had to wait uh, 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 to be able to, to come back to Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Uh, so also uh, among the older generation of activists, there is this um, awareness that Iran has its own agenda. And sometimes this agenda can fit their own agenda, sometimes it doesn't. Thank you. So thank you, both for coming to Princeton and for giving this talk. Um, I, I would like to make a couple of comments and just to nuance some of what you yeah. said. So you're absolutely right that the way in which these communities were incorporated into their societies uh, has long-term effects. Um, but my two comments. One is that it's really impossible for us to know with any certainty how Iran uh, manages uh, its relations with these communities, in particular because I think Iran is not involved in mass mobilization politics of these Shia communities. Rather, it targets specific subgroups, smaller groups of Shia, through whom they would like to uh, have influence. So you think of Hezbollah as opposed to, Hezbollah is not the entirety of the Shia population of Lebanon. Uh, you know, the Houthis are not all the Zaydis of Yemen. So they're, they're, they're focused on sort of elite groups. And it's through, it's through that group, through that group that they seek to, to have influence. Um, and Hezbollah and the Hijaz is one example yeah. of that. Yeah. Saudi Arabia. So, so that's one point. And it's, it's really hard for us to know how Iran deals with these groups that are political, military, and... The other comment is that, with respect to Saudi Arabia, the relationship of the state with, this, with the Shia population is, is quite complicated in the following sense. First, the Shiites of eastern Saudi Arabia were conquered. And they were conquered without fighting. Mm. And that's a very important point. They, 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 they basically opened the gates to Qatif and uh, Hufuf and, and Hassa to, to, the, to the Saudi forces. So the fact that they didn't fight gave them a certain status in the royal family. Uh, the second point is that the Saudi <coughs> Najdi society, the dominant society in Saudi Arabia, absolutely hates and discriminates against the Shia. And this discrimination takes the form of economic uh, uh, discrimination as well as social discrimination. And the government knows this about its own core population. And it can unleash the dogs of intolerance. But it can also protect the Shia at the same time. So the relationship is a complicated one that is both to threaten and to protect from their own population. And, and the Shia in, in Saudi Arabia, as far as I can tell, are really asking for economic and social rights rather than political rights. In fact, they, uh, whether it's them or the Sunnis, no one has political mm -hmm. rights. In, in the so so it, it, it's a complicated dance. 
uh, that the government plays with, with this community. And then there are tokens uh, that, the, that the government produces. For instance, Amin Nasser, the CEO of Saudi Aramco, is a Shia. So he is the exception that proves the rule. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I fully agree uh, on that issue. And the, the, this um, exception that you just mentioned, I think anywhere where there are discriminated against communities collectively, you have always this co-optation of exceptional figures. It happened in Iraq. It happened uh, uh, with the Arabs in Israel, uh, which was, uh, I did my PhD on them. So you always have uh, uh, policies of co-optation associated with policies of, 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 of co-optation of individuals associated with policies of uh, mass discrimination, uh, I would say. Yeah. Thank you so much. The impression that I have is that it's the 19th century, early 20th century, that the Shia population is increasing in these areas. But surely the Shias were there before them. And so can you roll back the time to the Ottomans and give us a sense on what was the relationship between the majority minority in that whole area? You know, was there a strike every day? Was there fights every day? I mean, it seems like today, it seems like every day there's a fight going on. But I have the sense that it wasn't like that before. But I like to be the expert. I'm, I'm not an expert in history. but I. But I think I am an expert of how history is being used contemporarily by, by political actors. Um, I, I was telling in my presentation that in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, the Shias have this nativist narrative saying, Shiism is, a, is an ancient local reality. And Sunnism is something exogenous that, can, that came from outside. Huh? Uh, um, and this builds on uh, facts that we know, uh, that uh, uh, Bahrain, what, what is called ancient Bahrain, that is the Bahrain Islands uh, of today and uh, the eastern province of, of Saudi Arabia, what is called today Al Hassa and Al Qatif, uh, 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 this region is an ancient Shia stronghold. Now there are remains which archaeologists are investigating of, of Shia religious uh, buildings, etc. And we have uh, also uh, uh, biographies of Shia clerics from this area uh, and in particular these uh, all these uh, data shows that uh, Shiism was encoded, was rooted in this region before even it was encoded in Iran itself you know, and it is known that when the Safavid took over in what is today Iran they brought some <coughs> Arab scholars, Shia Arab scholars uh, 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 from South Lebanon, from South Iraq, but also from Bahrain, and to help them to establish Shiism as, as the state religion. Uh, um, and, and so the Shias very much insist on there in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia on this, on this uh, history okay, of, uh, of uh, yes, we were here before you, the Sunnis, and so you have uh, nothing, you, it's not you that, that should teach us a lesson about loyalty to the state, about root in this land, Etc. Etc. And I think it's a very powerful uh, narrative. Um, so this is the, the the narrative in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait. But I, I think um, maybe Amit could say something about the United Arab Emirates, for example, uh, uh, where you have uh, a diasporic Shia communities mostly, and yeah? the, the people who are citizens today of the Emirates, of Qatar, of Kuwait, and even of Oman, they came. Uh, from mostly from Iran and from El Hassa in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, looking for a shelter or looking uh, uh, for a place uh, to develop their, their trade activities. Okay, and so you have somehow these two in the in the Arabian side of the Gulf. You have these two Shia realities somehow uh, a native, even nativist reality, and and then a diasporic reality and, and this impacts a lot the relationship with the state also when people know keep the memory of we came from abroad uh, uh, it's it's different uh, 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 than than people who feel that they were here before and they've been sub subjected submitted by an external uh, by an external power Any other 
another question? Yes, go ahead. Um, I have a comment of the United Arabs being from the Emirates myself. Um, the government, in fact, have made initiatives to incorporate the Sheikh Foundation, uh, even uh, sending the Sheikh students, uh, fully sponsored by the state, to go to Najaf, Iraq, and pursue uh, Hausa education, so, which is interesting. And it's uh, incorporating the uh, religious education of Sheikhism within the UAE, uh, not to mention Iranian schools and uh, Iranian schools. Uh, uh, my question about the Sheikh scholars and their role in role in post mobilization. So as, we, as we know, the Shia follow a major, right? A supreme scholar who they follow, whether in Iraq or in Iran, um, or in Lebanon. What are their roles um, in the political mobilization of this? A comment on your comment for the Emirates. Uh, uh, I didn't know that information, but it's interesting because what we see, and I saw that in Israel also, uh, uh, um, a, a policy of the Israeli government to, to, to foster somehow an indigenous Arab-Israeli Muslim leadership, if you want. Uh, 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 and so this could be also part of an attempt by the Emirati government to have a local a Shia uh, uh, scholarly elite. Yeah? Because as far as I know in the Emirates, but in Qatar, and even in Oman, uh, the clerics are mostly uh, foreigners, uh, Iraqis, Saudis, sometimes Bahrainis, sometimes Iranians also. Uh, um, and, and so this could be also part of, of a very um, common policy of indigenizing um, the religious leadership of the Shias. Um, what was the, the second part of your question? Yes, yeah, the, the, the scholars. The role of the scholars is, is very important, at, as it is in the other uh, Shia communities. Uh, uh, the, I mentioned this uh, Shia Islamic movement, al Wifaq, uh, which is really a mass political movement, which is something that is quite unique uh, uh, for the Gulf monarchies, where you don't have mass political movements. It's a general secretary who was a scholar trained in Iran, in Qom, uh, Shah Ali Salman, who is now <coughs> in prison. Um, um, so, so in Saudi Arabia also, and the, the, the now old leader of, of the most important Shia Islamic movement uh, um, uh, is also a scholar, Hassan Safar. He's been trained in, in Najaf and in Qom. So still, uh, we, we find the, the political relevance and importance of, of, uh, of the Shia scholars, uh, no doubt. It's, it's a typical pattern. Any other question? I would also pick up on the previous uh, yeah. <laughs> two previous, uh, and then I will get to your, to your question comments. That and also on the, the issue of um, I was wondering uh, how economic ties could be important uh, because you mentioned the UAE and the UAE-Iran relation acquired their autonomy because of the you know historical depth into economic relations that. Uh, exist and uh, <coughs> the manifestation of that was that Qatar had to, you know, to respond to to Saudi Arabia and to the UAE uh, because of the relation or supposed the relation that it has with Iran, but the UAE has never cut its relation with Iran. And also, when you, we look at the pilgrimage between Iraq and Iraq, I means uh, it's not the Gulf exactly, but you know, it's quite an autonomous movement. It's facilitated by a state, but it's not a state movement mm -hmm. of one million Iranians going to Iraq every year. So how do you think that this economy, is there any point of view, uh, let's say, uh, political uh, point of view in Bahrain or in Kuwait, uh, um, trying to look at these kind of connections rather than always playing over cleavages and uh, a Sunni Shia division? I think, as I said in my conclusion, I think that yeah, that uh, economic relations between Iran uh, and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia are not that important yeah, for the no. for the lo yeah. local economy. And I don't know personally um, Shias in Saudi Arabia and in Bahrain who are also businessmen mostly involved with, with Iran. I mean, with business, important business ties with Iran. I've never met people like that. Well, I met a lot in, in Kuwait. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of, 
a few of the MPs, the Shia MPs, they, they have business relations with Yon. They are, they are businessmen at the time, uh, at the same time. And, and, and so they, they, they play uh, on their intimacy with Iran, their family ties, right. their connections, in order to, to, to do business. Um, I think these economic relations could be another factor playing out in, in uh, maybe the, the stability of the relationship between the Shia communities and the state. In the sense, we see this Nasser al-Mohammed uh, prime minister, who uh, uh, was a, a diplomat in Iran, an ambassador in Iran, and having so many business connections in Iran. Uh, when you have such business connections at such a high level of the state, uh, uh, you don't want to mess everything. Just because Saudi Arabia tells you Iran is doing that and that, and the Bahraini government is pressuring, etc. Uh, these are of course, long-term patterns and well-entrenched interests that can also contribute to, to maintain the stability of the relations between the local Shia communities and the state. However, we could say also that it is maybe because the Shias were never a problem in Kuwait, that these relations have developed, you know, it's because it was never seen as a problem by the Kuwaiti government. Shias, uh, play, uh, I mean, speaking Persian, Marrying with Iranian women, uh, um, no. And as I, I was saying, it's it's um, you don't have Iranian migrants in in Bahrain today. No, most of the migrants are, are from from Pakistan and from from India, especially. You have still in Kuwait. Yeah? While uh, we know that that uh, officially, I mean, there is no policy on, of opening the door to Iranian migrants. But you have a lot of Iranian migrants, and they benefit from these old networks of patronage, business networks, but also political networks of Shia MPs and political figures. And so these political relations that support and they make possible larger um, types of relations, like larger, uh, yes, wider, I would say, yes, types of relation of economic nature, for, for example. Thank you. Your question. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just curious about transnational Shia political movements and the interaction between different strands of transnational Shia activism over time. Because as we were saying, in the 1990s and 2000s, some of these transnational groups largely imported from Iran and to Iraq and then from Iraq to the uh, GCC space took on more of a, a secular, even sort of human rights activist uh, kind of position in, in state society relations. In, I'm referring especially to the Bahraini case. So you had uh, moments where former Shirazis or former Dawa activists were collaborating on the same political project despite previously being in political competition. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the interaction between these different uh, political movements who are competing for that uh, that base of Shia transnational political support and how what the interaction between them looks like today. Um, today, I mean, these movements are still uh, organized. I mean, they are still embedded in, in transnational political networks, no doubt. But the relevance and uh, of these networks is not the same as it was in the eighties. Uh, uh, in particular, because as I said in the presentation, um, since the 80s, uh, the, the, the strategy of local Shia political movement has been to localize, to domestify, uh, to, 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 to not to care anymore about uh, issues like, are we with Wilayat al faqih or are we against Wilayat al faqih meaning are we supporting the Iranian political model or not. Uh, this uh, 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 was perceived more and more by the leaders in particular as, as being irrelevant issues. We should matter only about uh, liberalizing the political uh, uh, regime in, in, in Bahrain, in improving uh, uh, rights of Shias in Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. So, um, so these transnational networks do exist still. Huh? We see, in particular, people circulating in these networks. Now we see them, so so there are there is this kind of infrastructure that that is persisting. Uh, however, they do not play out the same way that than they were playing out before. And these are more networks of support, networks 
in which information is circulating. Uh, 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 also, when I say support, financial support, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, of, of, yes, uh, especially at times of, of elections. You know? uh, uh, this, is, um, this is, yes, still important. Does that answer to, to your question? Thank you very much, Thank Ron, you. for your talk.